grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's common to hear scoffers say that the church is full of hypocrites. It's just a bunch of people who don't practice what they preach. Some Christians respond to this accusation rather unfortunately by conceding the point. We're all sinners. None of us is perfect. So the church must necessarily be full of hypocrites. But is that what the church is? A house of hypocrites? Established by Jesus to be a house of hypocrites? That doesn't sound right. Jesus warns his disciples in Luke chapter 12, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So Jesus tells his church that hypocrisy is to have no place in her, and he warns that hypocrites are bound for hell. Well, does that mean then that we're all condemned? We say that we're obligated to keep the Ten Commandments, but none of us actually does it. Does Jesus then pronounce woe on us as well? No, he doesn't. And in order to understand the truth of this, we must properly understand what it means to be a hypocrite. The world uses the word hypocrite to mean someone who doesn't practice what he preaches. But this is not the definition of hypocrite that we find in the Holy Scriptures. The word hypocrite in English comes from a very similar Greek word, hypocrites, which is the word that we find in the New Testament for hypocrite. The word hypocrite was a technical term that referred to someone who played a part on the stage. It didn't have to have a negative connotation in Greek and could simply refer to an actor. That word hypocrite did have a broader meaning, though, and could refer to anyone who pretended to be something he wasn't. And it's that negative connotation that survives in English today. But note carefully, a hypocrite is not someone who doesn't practice what he preaches. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be something he isn't. That's what the word hypocrite means throughout the New Testament, a pretender. The enemies of Jesus were known for their pretending, their hypocriting. For instance, in Luke chapter 20, it says, They watched Jesus and sent spies who hypocrited, who pretended to be righteous, that they might catch him in something he said. And Jesus was constantly calling them on it. You actors, you pretenders, you hypocrites. Why put me to the test? And even when the scribes and Pharisees weren't trying to trap Jesus in his words, they were still hypocrites, always acting, always putting on a show. Jesus comments on the showiness of hypocrisy in the Sermon on the Mount. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. The life of a hypocrite is a life of masks and makeup, of stages and scripts. And it is not just innocent pretending. The hypocrisy of hypocrites is meant to deceive. Hypocrites don't want people to look at them and appreciate how well they're acting. 
Hypocrites want people to look at them and believe that they actually are the characters they're pretending to be. And what are hypocrites pretending to be? When it comes to a play on a stage, someone can pretend to be many things, but in the New Testament, there is one thing that hypocrites pretend to be. Everyone who's called a hypocrite in the New Testament is pretending to be righteous. Hypocrites pretend that they are not sinners. They pretend that they do not need the grace of God. And thus you see that Christians are not hypocrites. But, as well as hypocrites may be able to deceive their fellow man, they cannot deceive Jesus. He calls them on it outright in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Turning to today's reading, we hear Jesus tell a parable to hypocrites. They are called hypocrites in the reading, but it's clear from the description of them that they are. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and treated others with contempt. We hear at first that these people had so deluded themselves with their pretending that they actually thought they were righteous. It is the nature of hypocrisy to fool the hypocrites more than anyone else. Secondly, we hear that these hypocrites treated everyone with contempt. A hypocrite has to despise everybody. And I'll tell you why. You see, the hypocrite can convince himself that he's righteous by judging himself according to the righteous law of God. Then the hypocrite would only learn that he is not, in fact, righteous. But a hypocrite has to have some standard of self-evaluation and judgment. And so rather than judging himself according to God's law, he simply compares himself with his fellow man. But then in order for the hypocrite to think he's righteous, he has to appear in his own eyes to be better than everybody else. This means the hypocrite must fixate on other people's faults. Notice their wrongs. Find things he can look down on so that he can think more highly of himself. And if a hypocrite should happen upon someone who actually is more righteous than him, he will simply hate that poor man for no good reason whatsoever. As Jesus begins his parable, he sets before us the arch-hypocrite, the Pharisee. This Pharisee despises mankind generally, and the tax collector specifically. He supposedly prays, but he's just pretending. He doesn't actually ask God for anything, because he doesn't think that he needs anything. He comforts himself with what he hasn't done, with what he has done, but he does not take any comfort in what the Lord has done. And he has acted so well that he has fooled himself. He really does think he's righteous all on his own. Now, as we digest what this Pharisee is doing, we recognize how vain and false he was. But we should also recognize how easy it is to be a hypocrite. It's easy to think of oneself as righteous, and to think of everyone else as sinners. It's easy to see the speck in your brother's eye and not notice the log in your own mind. Jesus recognized that this would be a danger, not only for the world, but for his Christians as well. And so Jesus addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount, which was not preached to the Pharisees, but to his own disciples. 
How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? And then comes the word. You hypocrites! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus warns, Christians can become hypocrites. How do we prevent this from happening? By seeing the log in our own eye. And for an example of this, Jesus presents us with a second man, the tax collector. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. The tax collector knows that he is not worthy to come before God, and so he stands at a distance. The tax collector casts his eyes downward in shame. He beats his breast, lamenting his sins. And he isn't pretending. He doesn't think to himself, how would someone act who was keenly aware of his own sins? No, he actually is keenly aware of his own sins. And how did he come to this awareness? It is the law of God that makes us aware of our sins. As it says in Romans chapter 3, through the law comes knowledge of sin. And this is actually good for us. Jesus doesn't leave us to our own devices to figure out what is a law and what isn't, what is sin and what isn't. Rather, Jesus holds up the Ten Commandments in front of us, in which we can see our own selves as in a mirror, and we can detect quite plainly what it is that's jutting out of our eye sockets. God's law exposes the sins, both of the Pharisee and of the tax collector, but it's their different responses that distinguish the two. The Pharisee pretends the log isn't there, and maintains that he is righteous in and of himself by closing his eyes and ears and ignoring the plain truth. The show must go on. In short, the Pharisee is a hypocrite. He also shows us what it means to exalt oneself, to lift oneself over and above the word of God. The tax collector, on the other hand, looks full on into the law of God, knowing that he can trust what he sees. What he sees is a log sticking out of his own eye, and he laments his sins. He doesn't pretend it's not there. He doesn't play the hypocrite. He beats his breast and calls himself what he is, a sinner. In this, he shows what it means to humble oneself, to acknowledge that God is in the right and he is in the wrong. But he humbles himself in another way as well. He prays. And unlike the Pharisee, he actually asks for something. The tax collector recognizes, I need something from God. I don't have everything I need in and of myself because I am not righteous. And so he prays. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the word that he uses here is not the usual word for have mercy that we find in the New Testament. It more literally means, God, atone for me, a sin. To offer a sacrifice that would cover over his sins. His prayer makes sense, given where he's standing when he prays it. And his prayer also shows us what our hope is when we become aware of our sins. The reason the Pharisee and the tax collector both happen to go up to the temple at the same time to pray is because there were two appointed times for prayer during each day. And those times of prayer corresponded with the daily offerings. Each day, once in the morning, once in the evening, the priests would sacrifice a lamb on the altar of burnt offering. A lamb a year old and without blemish. 
As the tax collector prays for atonement, there, right in front of him, is the burning lamb. The smoke ascending as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The tax collector sees that the Lord is making atonement for him, the sinner. The Lord has appointed this sacrifice because the Lord wants to make atonement for sinners. And it, it is on the basis of that sacrifice that the tax collector dares to suppose that God wants to be merciful toward him. Now we can see the same thing in Jesus. He is the ultimate sacrifice to which all of these daily sacrifices point. He was sacrificed on the altar of the cross to make atonement for you, a sinner, to bring you near to God instead of leaving you far off, to lift up your head instead of leaving you downcast, to change your mourning into dancing. It is because of Jesus that you go down to your homes justified, that is, righteous in the sight of God. The Pharisee pretended to be righteous. He pretended he wasn't a sinner, that he didn't need the grace of God, but he was not, in fact, righteous. Yet, the tax collector, the arch sinner, who knew his own unrighteousness and confessed his own unrighteousness, he is the one who is declared righteous for the sake of Christ. And thus you see from all of this that being a hypocrite is a far different thing than the world imagines it to be. And in fact, the world is the hypocrite who delights in its own so-called righteousness and scoffs at Christ. But the church is not so. The church is characterized by genuine faith, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Or to put it more literally, unhypocritical faith. Faith that isn't acting. Faith that is honest about what is trustworthy and what is not. Hypocritical faith trusts in oneself, but unhypocritical faith trusts in Christ alone. So also the church is characterized by genuine love. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, let love be unhypocritical. Christians can truly love. Because we don't do good toward others in an effort to prove ourselves righteous. We don't put on a show with our good works in order to be seen and praised by man. We don't have to despise everyone else and stir up a false confidence in ourselves. Instead of all these ulterior motives and because of Jesus, we love others simply for the sake of others. And as we go about loving in that way, unhypocritical, we know that our righteousness is secure in Christ, to whom be honor with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.